There it goes. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Glenda. Hi, Chuck. <laughs> I just feel like I'm here with some friends. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. I have to say I'm so excited to see this many people in the room for our annual plan forum. Kathleen spends months preparing the draft, and when we get to this event, we always record it, so it is being recorded so that we can share with clubhouses and different groups and people who may have transportation, uh, transportation challenges. But this is the first time that we've had this many people in the room to hear the draft and to um, offer their input, which we value so much. So thank you. Give yourself a round of applause. You do have an agenda. You have a copy of the draft of the annual plan. And you also have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. We made a few last minute changes. But I'm going to email everything to you afterward as well. We're going to kick the afternoon off with a few words from our CEO, Annette Downey. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I will say uh, I just peeked at the agenda when I was walking around there, and I see you got me down for five minutes, but then Kathleen assigned me nine slides with lots of content. So <laughs> I'm going to go over, but nonetheless, we, d we don't want to keep you here longer than we need to. We really want this to be about you guys knowing what we are perceiving as the priorities in the county, uh, the initiatives that we have been working on, we want to work on, and then hear what you guys have to say. Uh, did we? Are we hitting it on the Mark, are we are we touching on the priorities that you see as valuable, either as somebody who utilizes services, cares about people who utilize services, or a service provider that is right there with us trying to provide the best services so the folks we serve have the best lives. Uh, so that's what tonight is about, hearing what you guys have to say, sharing what we have in mind, and developing the best annual plan that we can so that we can serve the folks in our county to the best of our ability. So I'll kind of dive in. I'm, I'm just going to do a bit of an overview uh, about our agency and our mission, vision, and values, and, and things like that. Um, so I know when I first became connected with Oakland County back in 2004, I remember the mission because I absolutely loved it back then. Um, and it was that the mission of then the Oakland County Community Mental Health Authority uh, was to improve quality of life and increase social justice for all, uh, particularly people that are served through our system. And I loved, loved, loved that mission. And then when the board said they were looking at changing the mission and the branding and such, I thought, how can you improve on that, improve quality of life? And social justice, that's what we're about. But indeed, that's exactly what occurred in our current mission, I love just as much actually more, is to inspire hope, empower people, and strengthen our communities. And really, that is what we are about, right? It, it touches on people. It touches on all we want to do collaboratively in our community. And of course, giving hope and optimism and strength to people is what we're all about. So, so I absolutely love that mission. And I applaud the board and, and those who helped with uh, reframing it and continuously making it better and better. Then there are a uh, vision statement. Our vision statement uh, leads off with that we want to be a national leader. And, and you know, why do we want to be a national leader? Because we want to know what's innovative, know what's progressive, know what uh, current research is saying will result in best outcomes for folks. Um, so sometimes when an organization is very long standing and has been around for decades and decades and decades, you risk falling into that's the way we've always done things. Um, so I hope as you have grown to know us, work with us, you'll find that we try to know what's cutting edge in our field. We try to research what best practice is. And we work collaboratively with our provider network, our stakeholders, to say, this is what we're hearing. Uh, and, and sometimes that involves change, right? And change can be hard. Um, some change is easy, because we're like, gosh, that sure makes sense. Let's do it tomorrow. Um, and other things take time and time. But being innovative in service delivery uh, is what's important to us. And when we say being a national leader, that, that means that we just want to know what best practice is and implement it, demonstrate it, and uh, most importantly, have the outcomes of our hard work benefit folks. 
Then we have core values, and these core values do get tweaked when we're reviewing our annual plan and our strategic plan. So as I go through these core values, and I'll also go through our principles and practices, if as you're listening, you're like, wait, sh they didn't comment on this, and you view it as something highly important uh, to the folks we serve and our communities, please, uh, that's why we're here, to hear your feedback. Are we, are we getting to the heart of what we're all here to do? Um, so one of our core values is to promote uh, equality and personal choice uh, towards people leading self-determined lives. Now you'll hear that framed in different uh, ways. Uh, you know, we obviously are about self-determination, person-centered planning, um, but we do want people to be calling the shots about what's important for them. Right? There's nobody who's a better expert on somebody's life than that person. And that's what we want to make sure that we're always keeping in the forefront in our dialogues and our exchanges and interactions. We want to use language that uh, promotes dignity and respect for all people. Now, this was a new core value that was just added in this last year. And if you guys have been around in, in multiple forums, dialogues, and discussion, I hope you've noticed a shift in the way that we refer to and speak about the people we serve. Uh, so a year ago, we kicked off what we were calling our hashtag less labels, more respect campaign. And we simply said, folks we serve don't need to be labeled as clients, consumers, recipients, patients. The people we serve are people, and we don't want the words that come out of our mouth to create stigma or to create this illusion that they're different than us. Um, so we dropped all those words from our vocabulary. We dropped all those words from our electronic health care record, our forms, our policies, and now we're trying. People would say, well, if you're not calling people clients, what are you calling them? And I'd said, we're going to call them the folks we care about, the people we serve, individuals who receive services. We're just trying not to have the words we use disconnect us from the people we're partnering with every day. In addition to this, uh, now that uh, you know this is the second year with regard to language, we're kicking off a reduction or elimination, if possible, but it's been hard, in our use of acronyms. So I don't know if you sit in a lot of meetings, but sometimes the use of acronyms, and I mean, I sit in meetings and I'm like, I really don't know what you're talking about. You're going to have to spell out what that means. And we've done some activities and some games and said, these are, you know, commonly, like we'll use a whole sentence. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think like when you say PCP, well, it depends. What do you guys think PCP stands for? That's a good answer. What my other people say per PCP? Primary care physician. What if you work in substance use? What you might think PCP stands for? It's a, it's a substance, and I, I can't. Yeah, it's it, it it it's a substance use, and it's a commonly term for a, a, a drug. Um, so we're going to say instead of saying PCP, just say if you're talking about person-centered planning, these kind of things. Nonetheless, that's kind of what we're moving to make language so that we're all on even tables and, and playing fields so we can have conversations and we're not doing any of this. We know more, we're smarter, we're, we're, we use fancy, you know, we all just want to be able to have language that everybody feels comfortable sharing their opinions and knowing what we're talking about. So that's what we're rolling out. Uh, we are guided by the goals, needs, and desires of the people we serve. Uh, so there is no stakeholder, group, or person that matters more to us than those who are actual uh, service recipients and, and receive services from us because they're the ones that we are here for and we want to know what's important to them. That's our top, top, top priority. Other core values, we are all about protecting rights. I, I'm sure you know we have a, a very, very solid recipient right protection system, due process. Uh, that is definitely a value uh, to our public mental health system. We lead with integrity, accountability, and transparency. Uh, so, you know, whether it be the Open Meetings Act, what's discussed at our board meetings, we have made some shift in the last year where we're trying to have more conversation open so that people don't think, oh, we're making all these decisions in these back rooms. There's tough decisions to be made in any service industry, including ours, and we just want to be as frank and honest and open and transparent about we're weighing pros and cons and keeping people first, and uh, transparency is key to leadership, and we hope that we have done a nice job of being transparent in our values and, and the tough decisions that we make every day. Uh, we're about strengthening our communities, and we are about collaborating. And collaboration comes in many forms. It's with individuals, serve, families, service providers, staff, and the community in general. Uh, and, and we want to be known as not only collaborators, but good partners 
to all of our stakeholders, including our provider network, who we know is closest to the people we serve. Uh, so we continue to aim to do that well. So with strategic planning and our annual plan process, uh, we develop a three-year strategic plan. Uh, the current three-year plan is from 2019 to 2021. So we are in the second year right now, and the annual plan we'll be reviewing is talking about our priorities, our goals, objectives for the upcoming year. And there are several uh, goals and objectives that will be reviewed. I will just say uh, keeping the concerns of the people we serve are always our priority. And these are some of the things that have uh, come to us through communication uh, as priorities. Criminal justice, employment, evidence-based practices, housing, healthcare integration, and transportation. Now these align pretty darn well with the advocacy work group that we've established and, and have met with uh, routinely over the last year. Uh, they identified their five top priorities regarding uh, advocacy, and those have been housing, transportation, employment. They added uh, direct support professional wages. We know there's a shortage, it's very important. And also the threat of privatization has also been an advocacy avenue identified from our advocates. Um, but nonetheless, it aligns pretty closely with the stakeholder feedback we've gotten in pre preparation for this annual plan. Well, the goals and objectives we'll be sharing are uh, expected with uh, 12 months. These are things for the next year that we will be uh, working on. And again, if, if as we go through these things, you say there's something very important that's missing from our annual plan, not only do we welcome your feedback today in this public forum, there is still opportunity for you guys to submit written feedback. Kathleen Kovach takes our lead, and she'll go, uh, as she talks about the plan, she'll talk about ways that you can make sure you or the people you serve or family members have opportunities to give input in this plan. It is by no means finalized at this time. It won't be finalized through until it goes through our board of directors. So uh, I will finally review our principles and practices. There are 13. As I was going through these with the mission, the vision, the core values, the principles, practice, I thought, gosh, we believe in so many things, but we support so many people. And even as I was uh, thinking, well, which one of these should I highlight? And they're all so independently important that I will mention each one. Um, first and, and foremost, person-centered planning and, and family-centered planning is important to us. It's about people being the captain of their own ship and honoring their expertise as the experts in their own life. It's about prevention, treatment, and wellness across the entire lifespan, whether that be infants and, and young children. We serve, uh, you know, we have a service array for, for young infants all the way up to older adults, so we have to keep all their needs in mind. It's about promoting recovery. So we believe in recovery with regard to folks who have mental health diagnosis, uh, folks who have uh, substance use needs, and it's, it, it's all that ties to that giving people hope. And if you know Sherry Rushman and the way she speaks about hope giving, recovery is possible. We see it every, every day. Treatment works, and that's a message we have to continue to uh, relay, not only to folks in our service system, but to our community as a whole. Self-determination, those of you who have known me for a long time know this one is very, very close to my heart. Uh, we continue to wanna see more people self-directing their own life, hiring their own staff should they decide, basically having control over their Medicaid service dollars in a way that they are assuring that the people that they feel will have the best outcomes on their quality of life are being hired and utilized as their service providers. So self-determination is something we definitely will continue to promote. We believe in Families and resilience, resilient families, keeping families together, supporting families well. Uh, there's a skill set, right? Like back in the day, we used to support people in group homes and day programs and even institutions, if you've been around a long time, where families were disconnected. And now families are staying more connected, and we need to do everything we can to keep that connection strong uh, and keep families involved with our loved ones. So uh, that is something we will continue to promote. Trauma-informed uh, systems of care is really important where, you know, our natural reaction in the past may have been to say, geez, what's wrong with you? Uh, with trauma-informed care, we know uh, it's more about what happened to you. So, so often people are responding to things that have happened in their life, and the way we frame the way we serve people does make a huge impact on their quality of life and their outcomes. 
Zero suicide is another one of our principles and practices. Uh, how many people are familiar with that concept of zero suicide? Okay, some are, some aren't. I like to frame it, um, and I found out about it one year ago. There was a, a presentation at one of the very first conferences when I, when I uh, started. Uh, but it's basically like if you think of the airline industry, and when they are flying planes and Delta, you would never hear Delta say, well, we hope we only have 10 plane crashes this year, right? The idea is even one loss of a death by suicide is too many. So as an agency that is working on prevention and wellness and hope and strength, uh, even one suicide is too many, and therefore we have adopted a zero suicide culture and promotion. Peer delivered supports and services. I suspect we have some peers right here in our audience. And uh, those of you who are close to our service system or people who receive supports, I, uh, my sister, uh, has been a certified uh, peer support uh, specialist for many years. Uh, I don't think there's any more valuable service particularly for folks, folks in recovery because they're interacting with somebody who's walked in their shoes, knows their struggles, and can give some practical tips and inspirations. So what we have found out is peers are able to do engagement and help people have hope, engage in services, stay connected in ways that uh, other clinicians had not been able historically uh, to do. So we want to continue to promote that in any way that we can uh, and because we see some, such great outcomes. A culture of gentleness. Now, if you've been around a long time, um, I know back in the early 90s, we used to call this gentle teaching. And basically, it's the mindset that the environment in which people live and where they spend their days really does have an impact on how they feel about themselves, uh, how they carry themselves, the goals that they set for themselves. Um, so cultural gentleness is about that. It's, it's, not, it's an approach saying, we're not here to change people or fix broken people. We're here to say, how do we be supportive of people for who they are and help them achieve the best life outcomes? It's a shifting of the environment to be supportive of individuals. Uh, this is another one that we added, service provision that advances community participation in belonging. So that was added uh, over the last year. Uh, that is basically saying uh, that we believe in community first, the most integrated, places that people can spend their day, the most integrated places that people live, smaller is better, the large congregate type service model is, is not seen as best practice federally, and, and in day-to-day -day interactions, people tend to do better when they're some, uh, supported, more individualized, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, very integrated in their community. So we believe in community first, uh, enhancing community participation and belonging in every way we can. And that involves community engagement and collaboration, partnerships, which we partner with law enforcement and the schools and the hospitals and healthcare. We're really proud of the work we've been able to do. I will say being in this building has helped us with our partnerships because we've been able to host a lot of events for uh, uh, different venues and places that just having people in the building, some days this building is just buzzing with collaboration and partnerships and I love it. Uh, and then of course, fiscal responsibility and efficiency. Uh, when we get to the budget part of the presentation, I wish I could say, you know what, the state's decided to give us a whole bunch more money, right? Uh, we haven't gotten a whole bunch more money. Uh, so fiscal responsibility and efficiency will continue to be conversations that we need to have to make sure whatever service dollars we have available to us, we're using it to the best possible impact for those we serve. That will always be our priority. Uh, no matter what funding we have, uh, the needs of those we serve will be our top priority. So I feel like I just shot a whole lot of information at you. <laughs> and I went over five minutes, and I apologize for that. Uh, but now I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen, and she's going to dive a little deeper into the actual strategic plan, uh, goals, objectives, and what we have uh, right now as our idea of, of the direction we're hoping to go for the next year. So let's give a hand for Kathleen Kovach. Thank you. As Annette had indicated, our uh, annual plan is ba based on our three-year strategic plan. And as she also indicated, this is the second year of our strategic plan. And so what we do when we identify the strategic plan is, is to take the strategic priorities and use them as a framework for the next three years. So what you see uh, on the screen or in your handout are the six strategic priorities 
for this organization and our provider network. As you can see, it's administration and operations, advocacy and empowerment, budget and finance, healthcare and wellness, supports and services, and technology and innovation. Um, we had a lot of input, not only for the strategic plan, but also for the annual plan. We do a survey and receive input from people served, families, advocates, providers, staff from uh, OCHN, Oakland Community Health Network, as well as the community. We do also have community conversations, such as we're having today. Uh, we had chat with our board of directors, uh, clubhouse members, drop-in center members, uh, staff within this organization, and we also presented at a variety of uh, groups like the Citizens Advisory Committee, the Citizens Evaluation Committee, Strategic uh, Planning Committees, and uh, a various number of other groups to get input. But what I also like to say is this is not a one-time deal. We listen to people all through the year. So if you feel like, gee, I, I didn't complete a survey or I really never had opportunity to provide input, as Annette indicated, you have the opportunity today if you're in the audience. If you're watching, you can still go to our website or email people you know to provide input uh, because, again, as Annette indicated, uh, I'm usually tinkering with the annual plan uh, sometimes uh, the day before the board approves it. So. Please do not feel like that the opportunity has passed you by. The first area is administration and operations. And as you can see, it does focus on efficient and management, uh, efficiency and effective management of this priority area. Uh, please know that the intent of being efficient and effective is to improve services and outcomes for people, so we always want to have the high bar. Uh, there are several areas we're focusing on in this area. Uh, accreditation, it has been a priority of ours for the last number of years. We are focusing on getting accredited by the National Committee of Quality Insur Assurance, NCQA is the acronym. We have had a site review and we are awaiting our final results. We do know that there are some recommendations. So going into the next year, we intend to take those recommendations and uh, meet the expectations of our uh, accrediting body. The next area is in terms of value-based contracting and financial reporting. Quite frankly, I'm gonna wait until Anya Eliasson, our financial officer, uh, comes and chats with you about, about the uh, budgeting goals and objectives. So she's going to speak to those areas when she joins you. In terms of provider network development, there are a couple of things we plan to do this year. Uh, many of you know that we have been uh, focusing on health and wellness. There are these things called HEDIS measures, which I have to read this. It stands for Health Effectiveness Data and Information Set. Uh, that is something that the physical providers have been doing and reporting on for a long time, but that has been part of our vernacular and our practice over the last number of years. It continues to grow, so we are tracking certain measures. Uh, do people um, have their uh, evaluations or assessments relative to their diabetes? Has their weight been taken? what's their outcome on some of the other health measures, and we are expected to report now even to our department on certain health measures. So we'll continue to do that, and we get evaluated against that. We also will continue to focus on the home and community-based waiver transition plan. Many of you are aware of the fact that the federal government uh, has asked that all states in this country uh, meet certain expectations. Uh, Annette alluded to that earlier in terms of uh, fewer people living together perhaps or people really engaging in their community, uh, not only in terms of their work uh, and their housing, but also really being part of their community, whether it's joining WISE, volu uh, excuse me, 
uh, the YMCA or um, volunteering uh, in prelude to some of their work opportunities. And then finally, what we also want to do is focus on another change that's happening with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services relative to the state uh, of Michigan's waivers. The uh, waivers actually over the last number of years have required the state uh, uh, at its central point to be more aware of what's happening in the provider network. We also are moving in that direction based on uh, their requirements. So relative to some of the waivers, we will now be taking a more active role in submitting the applications for uh, people becoming part of the waiver or continual renewal of those waiver waivers. So it really is going to cause us to make some structural and organizational process changes in order to meet that. Next area has to do with advocacy and empowerment. And many of you know that we have been focusing on civil rights and guardianship, and really more specifically on supported decision making, or as many people know of it in the past, alternatives to guardianship. So this organization has a, lo a long-standing group that meets re regarding supported decision making. We participate at the state level and we will continue to do that. And one of the things we like to do with that is have a, an objective that really measures whether there are more people involved in supported decision making and fewer numbers of people who have guardians involved in their lives. Uh, many of you know that uh, Christine Burke and uh, the communications team are very involved in advocacy and community education. There are a number of initiatives that are occurring. I don't know how many, how many of you participate in the advocacy uh, network meetings that occur, I believe, quarterly. And as Annette indicated, there are five areas that we're focusing on. If you recall, some of them are housing, employment, transportation, direct care wage. So we will continue to do that work. I believe we added a new group recently, and it's really making sure that we hear people's voices or the voices of families. So we have a family member who has stepped forward to lead that group, and we are certainly hoping to grow that group and get more direct uh, feedback and input into the kind of organization that we are and, and we want to be. Another thing that we're doing uh, relative to direct care wage actually is in that advocacy network group, uh, there was a recommendation to be more actively involved in, in sort of centralizing how we hire or recruit, I should say first recruit, um, people who want to be direct care professionals, direct support professionals. And so we are going to do a campaign uh, with the input of providers and people served on how do we get the message out to our community so that more and more people are interested in being direct support professionals and that there may be an easier way for providers to go about recruiting people for their organizations to support the people we all care about. And the last area in terms of community education, quite frankly, is a, a crossover into what we call social determinants of health. And I don't know if many of you know that uh, loneliness has been identified even at the national level uh, with the Center for uh, Disease Control or some of the National Health Institutes as a, an epidemic almost, that loneliness can create health issues. And so we're going to have an increased focus on how do we support people to get connected to other people, enter their community, and thereby reducing their loneliness and improving their health factors. planning. Uh, PCP, as we call it, uh, continues to be central to the work that we do. We actually had this as a more active objective a number of years ago. Uh, several of us got involved at the state level on a statewide committee. We had hoped that uh, it would have speeded up a final product. Uh, there is some work that's being done. We'll continue to provide input, but we've uh, finally decided or have decided that we really can't wait 
that there is a need to course correct some of the uh, practices that are occurring around person-centered planning. And I say that not with ill intent, but we do hear from the people we support that they would like to see approved person-centered planning and that people involve them more, listen to them more in their lives. So we will be working with our training uh, department on uh, putting together uh, training materials, training events around person-centered planning. And really the same goes for self-determination. Uh, we need to uh, educate people more about what it is. It is not a budget. It is not a home. It is not a person. It is a, a way of uh, getting people the lives that they want and funding it in certain ways where they have more control. So we want to increase the number of people who are involved in their own self-determination, be it uh, through budgeting. Uh, but nonetheless, we know that uh, we can do a better job, especially for people who are supported uh, through the network for people with mental illness. We know that there's a lot of room that can occur there to improve the numbers of people who have self-directed lives. Anya is going to come and talk about budget and finance and a little more about some of the new contractual service models that we hope to roll out. Good afternoon. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, I'm going to jump back a couple of slides just to go through the administrative um, and operations um, items that um, are particular to budget and finance. Um, so listed in your uh, packet on page four, we have value-based contracting. And so this has been in our annual plan for, I don't know, several years now. And so we've rolled out um, outcomes-based contracting to all of our service lines except for the substance use network. So this year we will be focusing on the substance use network and rolling out an outcome-based service model for that network. And that's really a function that includes the majority of um, the teams in this organization from clinical to IT to the service networks um, and everywhere in between. And we really try to engage providers in that process to make sure we're not just throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, but really that we're trying to get the best outcomes for people served and that we're making sure that from start to finish, um, we're trying to take everything into account so that there are less tweaks that have to be made on an ongoing basis. But it is something we do look at um, annually to make sure that lessons learned are reflective in each year's model. Um, so objective two under that particular item is the review of the, the service models in other areas. So each year we go through a process of reviewing the data that has come from those models. We sit with the providers and talk about the service models, the change in any outcomes, and even this morning talking about moving from just stretch goals to both out, minimum expectation outcomes and stretch goals. So continuing that evolution of service models and paying for outcomes has really been a process that we've, um, we've really taken to, to be an ongoing um, process that includes all parties involved, making sure that we're really getting what we wanted and that we're not hitting any barriers related to data or anything else. Um, the other administrative item that um, I have in this annual plan is um, implementation of a new financial structure internally. Um, we have changed how we've paid providers um, significantly over the last four or five years. So the, it's necessary at this point for us to change our internal uh, reporting structure um, and software to make sure that that meets those expectations. And in addition to that, we are looking at um, several new reporting requirements from the department that require us to now do our year-end reporting three times a year, as well as mon monthly financial reporting. So we're having to update that to make sure that we can um, meet those expectations and have it not take too much um, staff time. So we're, we'll be working on that as well. and finance section, which is on page six of your document. Um, so we'll talk about it more when we get to the actual budget section, but um, one of the things we will be um, doing is um, looking at the new rate methodology that the department is implementing this fiscal year. As of today, we still don't have rates um, for October 1st. Um, 
the methodology they're using has changed quite a bit, as well as the, the, the data set they're using, they're working from. So as soon as we have those rates, um, we'll be taking a hard look at those and really looking at what, what revenue we expect to come in and how we expect the revenue to change based on the new funding methodology. They've moved, they're moving away from what has historically been called a geographic factor and moved more towards what they're calling an area factor, which is morbidity and transportation. So um, hopefully that uh, benefits us. I do expect there to be an, an increase to how much. I don't know at this point, because as I mentioned, we don't actually have rates yet. Um, the other thing we're looking to do this fiscal year specifically is to make sure that we're, we're taking the information um, that the department has given us and creating a more automated process so we have a better way to predict uh, revenue. Um, historically, what we've seen is we have an assumption on, on, on what's going into revenue at the beginning of the year, and then we have to do amendments to adjust that going throughout the year. But we really want a better way to make sure that we know as soon as possible so that we can share that information with both the public and providers as soon as possible. So that's been really a struggle just because we get uh, information late in the year, and our, our revenue is really based on the eligibility of Oakland County, not just the people we're serving. So anytime you see particular trends with, with things like employment going, um, going up, our, our revenue goes down because less people are Medicaid eligible. So some of those things we can start to see and start to predict a little better if we have some better modeling that's done. So that's one of the things we want to make sure that we're looking at um, in the upcoming fiscal year. Um, one of our other obligations from a department perspective is uh, our annual risk plan. So the last few years, our annual risk plan has talked about um, the coverage of financial shortages as we've had, to, had continually, continually less revenue. We have to come up with ways to mitigate those risks and ways we're going to handle that because the department is very interested in how we will handle any, any losses we expect to experience. So as soon as we have rates, we'll make sure to look at those rates and, and start developing our uh, risk plan that's due to the, to the department in December. Um, the next um, item I have is um, alternative funding strategies to re reduce eliminate or eliminate variances and use quantitative flexible models for you and outcomes so um, one of the things we've been working on with providers last fiscal year was the development of a new funding methodology for residential services and by that I mean specifically licensed services so that will be rolled out in fiscal year 20 in addition to that, we do have um, the intention to work through unlicensed settings and a different methodology for unlicensed settings to make sure that, that what we're doing is um, both equitable and consistent across providers and, and people served because um, historically we've seen quite a bit of variance depending on the individuals and depending on what provider they were served through. So we're intending to make sure that that's consistent and there's some new logic for that. Um, That's it for my section right now, unless you want me to go through grants. Not yet? Okay. Thank you, Anya. Uh, Annette reminded me that I missed peer support services. Under, under advocacy and empowerment, I certainly didn't do that on purpose. Uh, but we always are looking at uh, increasing the number of people who are peers across all population groups and certainly the number of people who receive those services. In this plan, we are specifically looking at peer support specialists once again and increasing the number of peer support specialist encounters or activities with people who receive targeted case management. So I hope you noted that in the annual plan, and, and I do apologize for uh, overlooking that. This section, the next section, has to do with health care and wellness. And certainly this has been front and center for a number of years. It's, it's not the most important uh, piece of work that we do. Everything is fairly equitable in terms of uh, activities on behalf of people supported, but I think many of you know with the advent of uh, potential privatization, 
of the, our uh, work that we do through the public mental health system. They've paired it with the work of the Medicaid health plans and physical health. So across the nation, integrated health care uh, has been front and center, and it is also with us, not only in the state, but certainly with us locally. So there are a number of activities that we're going to focus on relative to health care and wellness. Many of you know that we have long, had a long-standing uh, requirement through our prepaid inpatient health plan contract to work with the Medicaid health plans. And we have, for a number of years now, uh, been working with the health plans as well as the Department of Health and Human Services to identify people who are at high risk or high uh, need of services and uh, that we mutually support. And so with the identification of people uh, at risk, we have monthly meetings with the Medicaid health plans and we focus on improving the health care of those people. So a number of people are identified. We have very active complex case management or care coordination at this organization. We work with the Medicaid health plans and then hopefully health care issues have been resolved and people come off that list and then new people are identified. So over the course of the year, we, we mutually support over 100 people uh, to improve their health care. So we will continue to do that per our PIHP contract or prepaid inpatient health plan contract, as well as the fact that it certainly improves people's uh, lives the second uh, area that we're going to cover under care coordination has to do with um, improving our efforts with Honor Community Health, that is our local federally qualified health center. And we want to improve uh, the uh, sharing of data or information across the systems. We also intend to work more closely with the Oakland County Health Division because quite frankly they have uh, home uh, nursing visits, and sometimes they see the same people that we see as well as the health plans see. So we want to coordinate all of that health care, and in order to do that in a better fashion, we want to improve our technologies to move information across systems. So that is another objective of ours for this year. And then we also want to expand our current uh, care coordination activities uh, with the Medicaid health plans, I think many of you know that with Section uh, 298, there, is, uh, there are pilot projects that are occurring and that uh, Oakland County has submitted some alternative budget language and we expect to use some of the current approaches with our Medicaid health plans and expand the risks, what we call risk stratification or the formula for identifying people who may be using emergency departments or being hospitalized so that we can improve outcomes for them. So uh, we are actually waiting for the state budget to be completed to know whether we will formally be involved in a more um, alternative 298 approach. So we've written that into the annual plan in uh, expectation that that's going to happen. We also are looking at emergency department hospital visits. Uh, we have indicated over the years that Oakland County has a very low percentage of people who are hospitalized compared to the rest of the state. And we certainly want to keep that um, as our high goal and expectation for this uh, county. So we uh, look to reduce hospitalization and emergency department um, visits. I think it's important for you to know that the state also is looking at this, and so we have a presence on various statewide committees and will continue to be involved in those committees uh, and so noted in the annual plan. Uh, in terms of population health, I have to find my place here. Uh, we will continue to use some of the uh, tools uh, to evaluate the healthcare data, we have uh, a, a tool called ProAct or CareConnect 360. Uh, ProAct is a, a tool that we use uh, with an algorithm uh, for all the data that re we receive that allows us to really crunch a lot of the data and information that we have 
and identify uh, people with priority needs uh, and uh, what kind of uh, health care visits they've received, what kind of medication uh, they're on, and really take a look at some of the high priority needs and work with the provider network and with work with people served to improve their health care. For instance, we are able to run all our data based on some of the claims that uh, have been adjudicated or uh, processed at the state level, and we can determine whether somebody had a recent visit, whether their diabetes is being addressed or not, if they have five or more medications, um, are they uh, getting good results from those medications, who are the providers who are subscribing excuse me, prescribing those medications, and uh, we're able to pull a lot of data and really do a lot of work to track what's happening with people individually, as well as do a lot of trending to take a look at what kind of training we might need for people in the provider network and what other kinds of monitoring that we need to do to get the outcomes for good health. Um, the other thing that we are taking a look at is uh, the continuation of our complex uh, care management initiative. Uh, we have supported quite a few people this last year, and we also track uh, the HEDIS measures uh, for those people too. And it, it really is to prevent um, health care issues and improve services for people. And finally, in the population health management area, we, are, we have a whole new initiative. We expect to have a whole new initiative around behavioral health homes. Some of you have heard that the Department of Health and Human Services approached uh, this county to see if we wanted to participate uh, as a behavioral health home. So we've been engaging uh, in conversations with the department as well as another area in this state, another region, where they uh, launched opioid health homes. And so uh, we're looking at the template on what this might mean to us and uh, how we go about structuring our organization to become a behavioral health home. Uh, the last area I'm going to talk about has to do with supports and services. And, and it's a fairly extensive area uh, we do continue to focus on children, youth, and families, and we really are also taking a look at outcomes for the evidence-based practice and the work that is occurring on their behalf. Uh, we are going to be adding some incentives to our service models to improve those outcomes. So Anya talked a little bit about the service models, that we have some minimum requirements or outcome expectations, but that we also do have incentives or stretch goals uh, to move uh, the network in the area of improving outcomes for children, youth, and families. We're also going to continue our work around uh, the Suicide Coalition. Uh, this organization has been involved with the Health Division for a number of years. We received a multi-year grant from the Department of Health and Human Services. And so I think we're uh, getting to the end of the cycle of that grant, but we have a strong coalition. And as you can see, uh, as Annette uh, indicated earlier, the zero uh, suicide policy is something that we have focused on. And it's not just our organization, it is part of the countywide coalition. In terms of justice initiatives, we, if you've been uh, at any of our board meetings, you probably have had the opportunity to hear of the wide variety of initiatives that are occurring around uh, justice, not only for adults, but for uh, youth. Uh, we do have a lot of grants. You'll notice in, our, uh, in the annual plan and the grant section or the grant page, you'll see a lot of uh, dollars that are flowing to support the justice initiatives. Many of you may have heard Kathy Yunker, um, who heads up this uh, whole initiative, uh, talk about the fact that we really are piecemealing this important uh, aspect of the work that we do, and, and a lot of the advocacy we've been doing is trying to get the funders to just outright fund 
this initiative be, uh, because we know that all our touch points with the justice system is extremely important uh, to the lives of people, keeping people out of jails and the justice system, and quite frankly, getting people into treatment. So what we want to do is expand what is called the Rapid Engagement and Access to Community Health, which is the acronym is REACH, uh, the REACH services. We do have that embedded in the Oakland County Jail, and it, as indicated, it's to reduce incarceration, recidivism, uh, and provide a greater access to services. Many of the staff uh, are embedded in the justice system, and they also act in an access capacity as a front line to making sure people come in uh, to our system for services and supports. And the other area we want to focus on this year is actually a touch point with the school systems. We know that uh, there is a lot of youth mental health first aid training that's occurring. We want to also make sure that youth uh, people attending school are aware of the fact that there are mental health services available to them. So that can only come through a coalition of work. And uh, we are part of a coalition that touches the school system, and we will work with them to improve awareness and access to uh, public mental health uh, services. Crisis services has been big uh, this last year. I think many of you know we rolled out what is called an intensive crisis stabilization service. Uh, that is for youth and families uh, in Oakland County, and it's not just for people who receive ser services through the public mental health system. It's for everybody and anybody, and we've seen uh, the awareness of that mobile crisis unit grow and the numbers increase, and the intent is to be a service to all families in Oakland County and hopefully um, provide some diversion also for families so that people uh, don't necessarily have to come to the public mental health system for services, but nonetheless, it, it is a first point of contact for many uh, youth and many families and that is a, a way to access services also. Cultural competency continues to be front and center. Many of you know we have a five-year plan around diversity and cultural competency. Uh, we actually have a staff person, uh, Nicole, Dr. Nicole Lawson, who was accepted into the National Council's uh, learning community. And so she has, over the last number of months, participated on a national level to really plumb the depths of what is discrimination, what is racial bias uh, on all different fronts. And she is bringing that information back to our organization so that we can really take a look at our data, take a look at our training, and determine whether we are meeting the needs of all citizens in Oakland County. Permanence of health, that's the housing, employment, transportation goal uh, that I talked about earlier. Certainly, we want to continue to increase uh, the number of uh, housing uh, opportunities for people. So we've been working with Community Housing Network on this goal for a long time. Uh, and, they, and most of the work that they do to get grants are for scattered site development so that we don't have large complexes of people living together and they will continue to work with us to make sure that there is a for safe affordable housing available to people we support. Uh, we also are going to continue linking people uh, within our public mental health system uh, to uh, other people if they want roommates. That's part of the Oakland Housing Link. And again, we've worked with Community Housing Network to develop that. It's kind of like a um, what is it? home finder service, if you will, and roommate finder service. I couldn't quite, I know there's a name for that. Um, it'll come to me. But it really is a, a technological solution to really uh, identify where people might have opportunities to live if they want to live in the northern part of the county that we make available to them opportunities, housing, uh, the housing that's available, as well as maybe roommates who might be either living in that area and need a roommate or who might 
be interested in pairing up with somebody else to live with and want to move into certain parts of the county. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we developed Oakland um, uh, Housing Link last year, and we're really doing a number of refinements around that. Employment, what can I say about employment? We're, we're all for it. Uh, we know that people are at different points uh, in, uh, in moving along toward income generation or em employment uh, with a, a company or an organization. Uh, we support people volunteering, uh, getting connected with their communities, learning all the social graces, if you will, of being an employee. And those things are really important so that people can get jobs and fit in and maintain their jobs. So um, more uh, to come on employment. We have a number of initiatives and are working certainly with many of the providers. A number of you are here today to really improve opportunities for people. And transportation, again, has been a long-standing agenda item uh, objective in our annual plan. Many of you know that Mike Daly has headed that for decades now. I think perseverance is the word around that. But we recently got some grants uh, to uh, work with uh, the more formal transportation systems in partnership, as well as grants to do more voucher uh, payment for volunteer drivers. So those two objectives are in our annual plan. Uh, in terms of substance use treatment and prevention, uh, what can I say about uh, what is called the opioid epidemic? Excuse me, I'll go back here. Uh, we will continue to work on prevention and treatment around uh, the epidemic. I think it's important for people to know that certainly a measurement or a goal is to reduce the number of uh, deaths uh, through uh, opioid use. And I'm happy to say this last year that in Oakland County, uh, that statistic has declined. So uh, I believe the multi-prong approach that we're taking in terms of prevention and, treat and treatment is working. And that pretty much wraps up services and supports. So uh, what I'd like to do now is introduce Diana Bunshu, she's going to talk to you about technology and innovation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so really, as we hear about what both Anya and um, Kathleen have presented today, technology is woven all throughout this plan. So specifically, one of the things that we wanted to do was look at the tools that we use to provide data to our staff and to our providers. Um, last year, we had a goal to evaluate our tool. We have selected a new one um, because what we do is we use what are called dashboards. For those of you who aren't familiar with those, those are a way that we can visualize data on a graph instead of looking through a whole bunch of reports and trying to discern data from that. Um, we expect that this project, I expect that this project will probably take a year to 18 months. So our goal for this year is to work on uh, migrating half of our dashboards um, to the new platform by the end of the year. Um, additionally, what we're seeing in healthcare in general is a lot of healthcare technology coming into play. Some of it's been around for a while. Sometimes the prices just come down where it makes it more attainable, uh, as well as just new products continually coming to market. One of the things that we are really excited about is looking at and partnering with providers to use uh, technology to help um, people have independence in their homes, and also that we're hoping that we can help with the direct support professional shortage. So what does that mean in looking at tools that someone would be able to stay, for example, in their home at night, but be able to get assistance if they need it and not have to have someone there with them? Kathleen has also talked about this, and I actually see some faces that I saw at the Your Voice, Your Values conference. And one of the things that I talked there is about um, health information exchange. And what this does is it allows us to be able to move data between our providers as well as physical health providers to better be able to coordinate care. 
Um, one of the things that we have done is that we know from talking to uh, on our community health, and we have a large percentage of people who are shared between their services and our services, is that you're often making decisions as a healthcare provider in a whole, meaning you don't know what medications are being prescribed, so you can be overprescribed, receive medication that you shouldn't, maybe get extra lab results, or I'm sorry, extra lab tests because they don't have access to those. So one of our goals for this year, our objectives, is to be sharing data specifically with Honor Healthcare. Um, the next one is by the end of the year, we are going to be submitting, they're called ADTs, and I, I actually almost want to say, Glenda, what does ADT stand for? <laughs> but I won't. They are for admission, discharges, and transfers. And what we will be doing is sending those up to um, an organization that works on what's called a health information exchange, and they will send out an admission. So what that means is if I am admitted to Easter Seals, we will send that record up to, uh, it's called MyHIN, and they will send that out to, for example, like a Beaumont hospital. So if I land in Beaumont, that they would know that I am being seen at Easter Seals and they could contact them to coordinate care. So with that, I'm going to bring, or have uh, Anya come back up. Before I go on to the budget documents, I missed the back page of my goals and objectives, which would explain why I felt like it was pretty short. Um, so just to cover those um, briefly, I did talk about the um, developing the service model for substance, substance use disorder population. So we use that also as a budgeting strategy because, um, again, that goes to rate consistency and um, outcomes-based contracting, which does help us manage and predict costs. Um, as Diana mentioned, I believe, in her goal section, um, one of our other objectives is to use technology to help um, independents with people in their homes. So we will be developing a budgeting strategy to fund that as well. Um, and finally, managing um, hospitalization trends and understanding the trend that we've seen over the last couple of years of an increase in hospitalization expenses. Um, provider funding, so we intend to continue to support um, direct um, care professionals and those rates. And as I mentioned earlier, related to the unlicensed settings, um, working on new rate methodology um, for that. And finally, the funding advocacy with um, the department and legislators, that's kind of an ongoing goal, um, just to make sure that they understand our funding needs and what we do and why um, funding for the public mental health system is so important. So I just missed those last time. So um, on page four, I believe it's 14 of your packet, gets into the budget narrative, and I won't read that to you. Um, it's updated for this fiscal year. Um, but if you move on to the next document, which is on page 15 of your, of your packet, that is not deja vu, it is last year's budget. We, as I mentioned before, we don't have rates yet. So what I did here, we just put the placeholder in for all of the budget documents, including um, the budget, the fund source chart that we typically use, as well as the three-year projected revenue, and then the, the pie charts that we use um, to demonstrate proportional amounts of revenue and expenses. Um, so we have expenses all done. Um, that's all been completed with um, the historical data that we have now with service models. We're able to better predict um, um, utilization and expenses um, with the service model data we have now over the f past two to three fiscal years for some service models and almost a full year in for our newest service model. So expenses are all built and everything, but instead of uh, presenting you just expenses with no revenue, uh, we're going to wait until... Um, we have the revenue numbers from MDHHS or the department, and then, as Kathleen mentioned, we'll be tweaking this until the day before the board um, um, votes on it and making sure that um, those documents are included um, in this before they do. Moving on to the next section, uh, page 23 goes into provider agency contracts, and actually nothing changed on this part of the plan. Um, the structure of um, contracts is remaining the same with the boilerplate language that goes to pretty much everyone for the most part, that's all consistent, and then the attachments that are specific to either population or the services being provided. Um, the grant section on page 24, as you can see, that list continues to grow. Um, a few years back, I think we only had a very short list. Um, 
but we see lots of new grants um, this fiscal year, some of which you've heard um, Kathleen talk about and Diana talk about. Um, I see a lot of grant reporting related to all of these things, but lucky for us, it does give us um, some extra funds to uh, fund positions that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to fund and some initiatives that need specific um, um, focus for the next fiscal year. So. I'm not going to read through all of those you can see, but those are the um, planned grants for this fiscal year. And then the final section is just the glossary of terms, which is standard in our annual plan. As you can see, we have another ambitious plan. I always like to tell people this isn't all we're going to do for the year, but uh, they ended up being certain goals and objectives that we wanted to highlight. Uh, we knew we wanted to tweak certain things. Uh, we got feedback from people that they wanted to see certain objectives in our plan. I know that the people we support have over the years indicated, gee, housing, transportation, and employment is important to us. So we continue to keep that in our annual plan because we want people to know that we've listened to them and that it's important to us uh, to make sure that they're aware that we have uh, their needs, their wishes, and their desires front and center. So at this point in time, we're going to open this up for any comments or questions. And um, I'm not sure if we're able to get feedback from people who might be watching. Are they able to do direct feedback? We did record, so we're going to send out the presentation oh, okay. and we'll have people submit input uh, via uh, email. All right, so we're not live streaming. Okay. Yeah, you know, behind the uh, poll over here. You know. Okay, John hi Ken Tom, Jorsky I recognize the, the voice. Uh, uh, regarding technology and innovation, uh, Diane, I didn't hear anything mentioned about, pardon me, I'm, electronic visit verification, the EVV that's coming up, uh, the state, any closer to making that a reality, or what's the deal? Thank you. Uh -oh. There we go. I can give you um, some information about EVV, or the electronic visit verification. Uh, the state has been telling us and is still continuing to tell us to have providers hold off on purchasing EVV software at this time if they don't own it. However, there is progress at the state level. They are going to be issuing a request for information. It was supposed to be done this month. I don't know if it was actually released um, to get information about a system. And what they are going to be doing is purchasing a system that can be used across the state. It can be used with people can call in, a mobile app, as well as a website to be able to uh, utilize that. They did run, um, I don't know, I guess it was probably three or four weeks ago, they did have a group of us that they presented their concept map to of how things would work to see if we saw any holes that were missing. Um, we didn't see anything significant in it. So I, it looks like they are really trying to think things through. Still wait. Um, they are also submitting to the federal government that is uh, it's called good faith um, effort so that they will be in compliance for the first year. And with um, a implementation, Tom, do not hold me to this, but I'm thinking it's 2021, maybe January or February. Um, I'm more than happy to get that information to you if that's something you would like. I'm Glenda, uh, Glenda V. Dash um, from Oakland Family Services. I have just two quick questions. So this accreditation uh, national committee quality assurance NCQA, what benefits will be achieved through this accreditation? Or does it increase the opportunity uh, for more grants or um, government funding? What is the purpose of this accreditation? Uh, through our PIHP, prepaid inpatient health plan uh, contract, there is an expectation that this organization be accredited or certified. We had in the past been CARF accredited. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, She's trying to think what CARF stands for. Right. I don't even the know that I can tell you. Anti-acronism. <laughs> 
Okay. So it is just CARF. Okay. Okay. That helps me a lot. Uh, we were CARF accredited. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do when we selected uh, NCQA is to be in alignment with the Medicaid health plans. And okay. many of the Medicaid health plans are accredited through that uh, a certification body. So in in the vein of integrated health care and level playing field, that's why we chose that. It has, in many ways, uh, uh, focused on some business practices, healthcare processes. So we've made quite a few changes in uh, how we do some of the work we do here. Some uh, of the changes, I'm going to be very honest, have been very good uh, for outcomes for people. And uh, some of it has also been, how do you do this? It seems to be more in line with physical health care, even though that's part of what we do. It sort of takes us in a direction we've had to really jostle with a little bit, and we're still in that process. Second question is, where does the information come from regarding the data that supports a reduction of deaths um, attributed to opioids? I, I believe that's national data, state and national data. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's the Oakland County Medical Examiner okay. analyzes those numbers for us. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. We have help from other Oakland Community Health Network staff in case you watch this. Uh, there are other experts certainly in the room. Thank you, Glenda. Are there any other questions? Do you have any other input you want to offer for the draft? Chuck has his hand up. Um, I guess, uh, will there, uh, the mental and physical doctors be aware of the needs for the patient, the same patient? You know, if they have medicines for one, for the mental doctor, would the physical doctor be aware of the medications the metal doctors given the patient? So that is the goal of where we are hoping to head to, and that is most certainly what we're wanting to do for those who are served uh, more immediate in our future with um, Honor Community Health. So in the long-term picture, what we would hope is that when you go to your physical health doctor, that they can see your medications, and when you go to your mental health provider, that they can also see the medications as well. Um, it's going to take us a while to get there. This is, just seems to be a very slow-moving ship we've been all hearing about for years about how we'll all be able to remember it used to be on a thumb drive. You're going to be able to take your um, your health record with you wherever you went. Well, we're not there by any means, um, but I think that is where we will end up being. I don't want to put a timeline on it, but for now, we are just starting with um, outside of Honor Health, just admissions and discharges. I could also say that is a technological approach and very important to it, but we've had an expectation for many years that supports coordinators, case managers, work with people to uh, coordinate care with the doctor as well as maybe a psychiatrist or anybody in the public mental health system who supports you. One of the things we're also focusing on is that people take charge of their own health care. You know, you can, can say to your doctor, gee, I want you to have this information, or you can say to whichever agency uh, might support you, if you have an agency that supports you, uh, to say, I want to make sure all my physical health care is in one place in this organization. So a lot of the work that we do is, is empowering people to say, hey, you're front and center on your own health care. Uh, we're here to support you and assist you if you need it. But that is part of it, too. And I have to tell you, that's my own challenge. My you know, physicians and people who take care of my health um, say, hey, you have to actively participate. And I tell you what, some days I feel like it and some days not. But by and large, you know, I'm responsible for my health care. So it's a learning curve for all of us. 
It's also a high area of focus with our care coordination pilot that we're rolling out. So we are meeting with the health plans that fund the physical health care. Obviously, we're the funder of the mental health care. And, and we're identifying those people with the most complex needs. So um, right now it's a pilot. The numbers are small. We certainly want to grow it. Um, but we're looking at factors like people who, and I'm just grabbing numbers, but if we were to say people who have been to the emergency room five times in the last three months, there's something very complicated going on with their health care. And we focus our dialogue when we meet with the health plan saying, Let's make sure we have nurses at the table. We have our partners at the core providers with case managers. We have peer supports. We have hired uh, peer specialists who have special training in this healthcare coordination role to make sure that uh, people aren't using the emergency room for their medical. You know, we got to get that proactive, get in to see specialists, make sure medications aren't counteracting. So we're, we're trying to do a lot of work in improving. Uh, There's lots of obstacles that get in the way. You're right. And there's roles for peers to help with spend down and those kind of things too. Yep. So we're working on all of that. It's, it's a need. We know it is. Tim, can I go back to EVB for a second? Yes, you may. Um, so Tom, I looked up um, on my notes and it is January of 2021 is the go live date for the state system. Um, additionally, we will be issuing a provider bulletin and a survey to figure out and to identify those who do have um, EVV systems. So I'll be looking for that in the next few weeks. Because the state wants it to be compatible, what they're rolling out, what they're hoping will be compatible with what's happening at the local level. That's all of our hope. Lois. You mentioned about MyHIN, and I just, that's with the technology part of how we coordinate all this. So can you explain how we're working with MyHIN? I, my understanding was they were only working with the state, but then you brought it up today, so I was curious. Yeah, no, so MyHIN is actually working with hospitals, physician groups, um, all types of providers all over the state of Michigan. Behavioral health has really lagged in this particular area, and it's more of um, what's really been fueling that is privacy concerns, especially for those people who receive SUD services. So um, we are actively working with them. We actually receive data from MyHen, and now we will be sending data to MyHen. Um, additionally, I'm also participating in a work group with MyHIN, and we have had some other um, community mental health representation from across the state on an e-consent system. So what that would do is it would allow Anya, for example, to be able to provide consent for her SUD, SUD data to be sent to you, Lois, or to your hospital organization. MyHIN would receive that, check it, and then say, yep, you can have access to it, and then ship it on. So um, the state has a most certainly a partnership, but they are not really steering the ship at my hand, if that makes sense. It all goes to the question when I listen to what's going on in our CAC, there's a huge concern about privacy. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's incumbent upon us to reassure people that this whole technology thing that's going on is important. And in the end, it serves all of us. Because as Kathleen said, and I also, I want my doctor when I go to understand I'm a whole person and not just focus on the one thing. Because you're being treated at different doctors and with all the subspecialties and everything. So I hope that we can convey to people to, yes, be concerned about our privacy, but on the other hand, we have to balance it somehow where we are being taken care of as a whole person, but still know that be our private things are being respected in some sort of way. Yeah, and one of the things that I would say was when um, I presented at the Your Voice, Your Value conference, I would say overwhelmingly, while most certainly people said, yeah, we, you know, obviously stigma and privacy concerns, but there was really this acknowledgement of this is what we need. Because for all of us, we can speak even, I think, personally about going from doctor to doctor and taking your information and they say, you know, what medicine are you taking? And I, I'm always like, oh, I forgot that one. And they say, what are your dosage? I'm like, I don't, I take it once a day. And then they try, you know, filling it together. Um, 
So that is, as we talk about doing the admissions and discharges, um, for us, one of the things that we've done is that we are not submitting it for people in SUD who are receiving uh, substance use disorder services or for those who are in the jail. And we've also really have limited the data that we're going to be sending um, to tiptoe our way into this. And you know the state is also very interested in this because they know if they don't address the privacy concern that it's really gonna be hard to get everybody on board with data sharing. And so they have also been participating in this e-consent meetings. And in fact, I just received an email today because I had expressed some concerns. Um, they're looking for a pilot partner and I said, would love to do it, but I can't sign us up for that until you've addressed these other things. So, you know, they're looking at how do we make this successful as well um, to make sure that we are addressing privacy. I, I just want to add to that, and part of those conversations that Diana and, ha and I have had with people with the privacy really revolves around stigma, and we have made a commitment to individuals we serve when we talk to them that we will put together a campaign such as um, person first language and really reach out to our physical health care partners to help talk about stigma and, and really make them aware of how their words and actions impact the people we serve and how we can work collaboratively to change that. Another question from Lois. Oh, not another question, but or we comment. are active in the schools, and I hope that within the plan is also being active in our medical community because the new doctors that are coming out are so open to, to encompassing everybody that they're treating. So we have an opportunity. So I think also acting with the hospitals and the medical schools as well as education. Thank you for that. I can add to that too, just a little bit with our medical schools. So our local medical schools have already connected to our providers. Part of their pro rotation during their training is to go to all of our providers in mental health and really have firsthand experience in, in working with people who have mental health challenges. And I know that it is changing the way they choose their specialties in a positive way. Thank you for saying that. And I guess I'd have to say, also that this is Oakland Community Health Network's annual plan, but we would never be able to accomplish it without the provider network. You know, we do uh, some direct supports, but really the network is what makes this a success. So thank you very much. I'm just gonna take a quick poll. <laughs> How many here have completed the survey? Survey online. Okay, I saw a hand back there. Um, so after this, uh, tomorrow morning, we will send out the copies of the presentation, a link to the online survey. I very much encourage you. It's short, may take you 10 minutes, but we spend a lot of time looking at that data, and it's our best resource in really gathering what people are thinking and what's important to them and where their values lie in the direction we should go in the future. So. That was my plug for Kathleen's survey. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Again, thank you so much. Just thrilled at the number of people who showed up today. It's very much appreciated. We appreciate your partnership. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.